Welcome back. This is lecture eight, part one, and we're going into the introduction to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. I want you to remember that both Luke and the book of Acts, both of them were written together about the same time why, they, why Luke was in Rome. Let me bring your attention to a number of items so that we can at least settle those issues up front. And that is that you need to be ahead on your reading. Once again, I remind you, and you go, why do you always have to remind us? It's because then I get all the emails and all the comments that I just couldn't get the reading in and so forth. No, you see, this is, a, this is for my benefit, not for yours. Because when you come to me with the kinds of notions that you come to me with, and you send me the emails telling me I just did not have time and blah, blah, and blah, blah, okay? Uh, trust me, I am not Jesus Christ. I am not God. And so mercy from me is something that's highly unattainable. You will receive an exam. You'll have to take an exam. And remember that my exams are built around both my, around three things. The textbooks, my lectures, and my handouts that you're supposed to receive when you enter into the classroom and or you download them. So for this particular lecture, lecture eight, and this particular series of eight, you should be in Dr. Benway and Dr. In Dr. Carson's book, in this one, you should be on pages 198 to 206 now, to the top of page 206, 198 to 206. And then in Dr. Benway's book, you need to be from pages 107 to 115 this week. Keep up with your reading. You go, well, Brother Eddie, you just don't seem to understand uh, how busy I am. Well, perhaps I don't. Um, and perhaps that is an area, that is one of my shortcomings, that is one of my flaws. I, I will admit that, that I'm not too sympathetic in that particular area. Um, you chose to enroll into the seminary courses, so the standard must be maintained, and I will not relent on that issue. Uh, if you're going to discuss to me how busy you are in studying, how busy you are in preparing, how busy you are in the ministry, and so forth and so forth, um, I, 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 I comprehend that. Um, and I just tell you, welcome to the club. But, uh, let me explain to you. Um, I film everyday classes in the morning for two hours from 9 to 11, basically. Um, and then I, I teach my classes in the evenings, uh, so I do that. I'm in my office, in my church office, five days a week minimum. That's Monday through Friday. Uh, many times I'm in my office on Saturday. I'm here on Sunday in all of my services. I prepare for classes that I teach Tuesday night, Friday night, Bible study Wednesday night, Sunday services on Sunday. I lead a Sunday school class. Okay, I teach in two languages, English and Spanish. I have to prepare everything in English and Spanish. I have numerous handouts that we prepare in advance. Plus, I teach by way of Skype okay, to several countries in Africa, India, Pakistan, Brazil, Chile, so forth and so forth. I have to be up by 4 o'clock in the morning uh, because of the 10, 12, 13 hours differences in our time frame from here to Asia. Um, so I, I have an extremely busy, busy, busy schedule. Mm -hmm. And so when people tell me how busy the schedule is, ladies and gentlemen, that's probably the one I, I admit this is the one area that I have absolutely no sympathy with. And I have to read everything in English and I have to read it in Spanish and I have to prepare everything so I understand the issue mm -hmm. and if you don't feel that you can you can maintain a standard a godly biblical standard and you want and you choose to acquiesce to the culture and to a level of mediocrity then perhaps you should withdraw from the class I would encourage you to do so I, I would I, and, and it would not be a personal issue with me I would not be offended I will not be insulted mm -hmm. Um, as I am more and more convinced, um, and I've said this publicly, uh, in all the countries that I've visited, I've, I've been to well over, uh, I, I can't tell you, it's just so many countries now that I've been to, teaching pastors and training pastors and so forth. Yeah? And I can tell you that, and throughout the United States here, and I can tell you that I am more than convinced that 80% of the people who stand in the pulpit should resign, should resign from that ministry because they, 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 they operate at a level of mediocrity and they're content at that level. 
So with that said and done, I just remind you to keep up with your reading and turn in your assignments in on time. All right? You have to burn that candle just like everybody else is going to have to burn that midnight candle. Now, into the book of Luke, and I want you to see this with me. Here's the theme we're going to be working with in the book of Luke in this particular next few classes. Here's the theme. Luke clearly intends that his gospel and Acts, the book of Acts, be read in relationship to each other, but not as a single narrative broken in, in two only by space considerations. Okay? I want you to understand that it is long believed, it is a long standing belief that both the book of Luke and the book of Acts were written together at some point in time. And so those two books must be and should be studied together. But for our purposes of going through the New Testament, we happen to be going through, we've gone through Matthew, we've gone to Mark, and now we're into the book of Luke. Um, I can recall when I was in the country of South Africa, and in South Africa I was doing a pastor's uh, seminar class, uh, seminary class, and we were there, and I just, I, was, I happened to be in the book of Luke at the time, and, and I said, well, let me ask everybody here, and there was, uh, there was 613 pastors there. And so I just said, I just want to ask a real quick question. I said, it's not a trick question. I'm not trying to deceive you. I'm not trying to you know, uh, 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 be cute or anything like that. I just, just quick question quick answer, just raise your hands. I said, how many of you, and there were 613, said, how many of you uh, um, uh, believe that Luke was one of the disciples? That, that, was, that was the question. Mm -hmm. And I said, just, just hold your hand up. And they did. And so I asked somebody to count real fast, you know, and, and I, it's my amazing. I, I was just amazed. 209 people said that Luke was a disciple. One of the original disciples. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as we start out with the book of Luke, Luke was not one of the original disciples. He was not one of the original apostles. He was a Gentile, okay, who a traveling companion of Paul in particular, okay, and one of the most one of the few Gentiles that God used to write an, a gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so can you imagine I'm sitting there with 209 pastors out of 613 who tell me that they believe that Luke is, is an apostle. He's one of the original disciples. Was he a disciple of Jesus Christ? Yes, but was he one of the original 12 disciples? No. Now I want you to remind, so I want to, I want to keep that in front of you that this is a unique book unto itself. Now Luke starts out with the first four verses in Luke chapter 1. Turn your Bibles there, please. And let's look at this because Luke does start out in a quite unique way. And notice that he, he, he makes some statements here that really sets the tone for what he is doing. In Luke chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, it lays out for us, you know, why he's doing it, its purpose and his methodology, how he went about doing what he did. He says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, verse 2, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of, of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. There is a lot of information in these first four verses that establishes for us what takes place in this particular gospel. Well, what I want you to start out in my opening statements is that Luke is the longest gospel. Luke and the book of Acts, if one rejects Hebrews as a Pauline letter, if, I'll put that in parentheses for you, uh, contain the largest number of pages by any of the authors of the New Testament and Luke, he is a Gentile, second-generation Christian. This is a second-generation Christian who God uses to write the story of Jesus. Luke writes, the, Luke writes the best Greek of all the New Testament writers with the, with the possible exception of Hebrews. Greek was his mother tongue. He was also a highly educated, possibly even a physician. Um, the verses that uh, insinuate and allude to that issue, uh, it never actually says he's a physician, but clearly it is implied here, and most believe that he was a physician. 
Uh, Luke cares for those that others do not even think about when you put it in the context of the Synoptic Gospels. If you take Mark and Matthew, uh, you, you notice that Luke deals with a group of people that really no one even thinks about or even discusses or even mentions or barely get a, a mention at all. And so I want you to notice this. Number one, Luke focuses in on women. Um, he focuses on more on the issue of women and who they are than any one of the other four Gospels. To the poor, he deals more with the poor, those who, are, who have been downtrodden. Uh, and if you look at Luke's, uh, for better lack of a term, Luke's Beatitudes, if you were to look at that. If you would go to Luke chapter 6, for example, in Luke chapter 6, and if you just go briefly there with me, I want you to notice that in Luke chapter 6, it, it, starting at the very beginning in verse uh, 2, if I'm correct, it says here, but some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? And he now entered the house of God and took and ate and consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any, for any to eat except the priest alone and gave it to his companions. And this story goes on into all the way into uh, verse um, 23, all the way to the end of that. Um, you can stretch it. You can stretch it all the way to verse 26 if you want. But this is this this section will be called more or less like the Be Luke's Beatitudes here, and Luke really addresses more the issue of the poor and why Jesus did what he did. Also, he also deals with the ostracized. <laughs> The ostracized, uh, they get a bare mention in the other books, but Luke focuses in, in more on this particular group of people, uh, the immoral woman, remember her, in Luke chapter 7. If you remember Luke chapter 7, starting over there in verse 36, is it? In verse 36, all the way through verse, at the end, all the way to the end of the chapter, to verse 50, you know, um, uh, here, here, this whole section of scripture deals with this particular woman, um, the immoral woman, immoral women. Okay, uh, wh how, do, how do you deal with them in in the context of the church? How do you deal with them in the context of the community? And how did, how were they dealt with in the context of the gospels in the life and in, in life and teaching preaching ministry of Jesus Christ? Luke deals with them in particular. Also, the Samaritans. Um, if you recall, the Samaritans was a group of people that don't even get mentioned until you get to the Gospel of John, really. Um, but Luke it deals extensively with the, with the Samaritans, and he does so in Luke chapter 9, starting over there in verse 51, at the end of that chapter. Uh, you go look, at, look what it says in verse 51, all the way to 56. Um, so Luke chapter 9, 51, 56, he deals with the Samaritans. In Luke chapter 10 as well, in verse, uh, let's see, 29, you see in here, uh, the whole story of the Good Samaritan gets dealt with in verses 29 all the way through verse 37, is it? Uh, he deals with that subject there. And also in the book of Luke in chapter 17, uh, you see here in the middle of this particular section here, starting over there in verses um, 11, when, in the cleansing of the leopards, if you remember that. Okay? And so it goes through there. So Luke deals with this particular group of people as well that barely get mentioned elsewhere. Uh, also, he deals with the leopards um, uh, extensively here in Luke chapter 17. Uh, you'll see that here as well. Um, he deals with them at, 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 in addition to that. Then you have the tax collectors. You remember that. Uh, that was a group of people that was a real choice group of people that nobody wanted to deal with. And that's in Luke chapter 19. You'll see that in verses 1 through 10. Uh, he, gets, he deals with Zacchaeus and the tax collectors. Uh, so Luke begins to focus in on a lot of other people that people don't even think about, don't even pass their minds. And then in chapter 23, um, in Luke chapter 23, you'll also find where Luke begins to deal with at the middle of that chapter. Um, you remember when Christ was crucified, okay, he deals with the criminals, with the criminals here. And that'll be Luke chapter 23, verses 35, all the way to 43. And so he deals with these groups of people more extensively than any one of the other gospel. In addition, uh, Luke uh, records the eyewitness account of Mary. Okay, 
uh, that's what the first two chapters of the book of Luke is. It deals with the first, it deals with the eyewitness account of mother, the, the mother of Jesus, Mary, and Luke uh, deals with that subject, okay, and also possibly her genealogy, and that'll be the entire chapter, um, well, actually from Luke chapter 3 all the way to tw uh, uh, verses 23 to 38, Luke 3, 23 to 28, uh, deals with the genealogy, and Luke uniquely, he uniquely shows Jesus' care for women. Once again, I mentioned that, uh, given especially we live in a postmodern era where people are always arguing about how women are marginalized in the church and marginalized in society and so forth and so forth and so forth. And But what you do find is that Luke deals with this group of people uh, quite extensively. He deals with women and he shows the care for women and the care that Jesus had for women in particular. Well, a little bit about Luke himself, the author. Let's talk a little bit about him. Uh, Luke, um, uh, I think that the early church tradition unanimously uh, agrees that Luke is, the, in fact, the author of the Gospel of Luke. Um, if you're going through church history, Irenaeus, the church father, between the year 175 and 195, uh, when he wrote his, uh, his thesis against heresies, uh, he clearly mentions and makes a reference to Luke as being the author, the anti-Marcian prologue, to Luke um, around the year 175 more or less uh, says that Luke was the author as well. Uh, one of our early church fathers, uh, uh, Tertullian, Tertullian between the years of 150 and 160 and um, uh, more or less is when he was born to about 220 to 240 um, in his uh, uh, treatise called Against Marcion. Uh, he says that Luke wrote a digest of Paul's gospel. Um, so you were beginning to see the early church fathers. They were still very close. They were very close to, the, to that first century period for the oral, rich oral tradition to continue to carry forth. Okay, um, and then we have the Mauritanian uh, fragment, which is a document was somewhere between um, between 150 A.D. and 200. It names Luke in particular as the author and calls him a physician companion. Uh, that particular document does call him a physician companion of Paul. And also it says that he wrote his account by hearsay, meaning that he did interview with eyewitnesses. Uh, let me just stop there for a moment to explain a concept to you. Um, when we look at the Bible and we look at from the Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, and you understand the context of Judaism, which is really important to understand as we embark upon this search of the New Testament, and that is this, that in Judaism, the oral tradition, the oral passing down of the Word of God and the history of, of Israel, Okay? and the miracles and the dealings of God with his people. So you hear what I just said? The oral tradition of Judaism, how God dealt with his people, how Israel survived, the history of Israel, everything about it, okay? that, that singular mechanism, if, I, if you will, of the oral tradition of passing the history down and the memorization of Scripture from Genesis to Malachi was done orally. Mm -hmm. That was the supreme mechanism, if you will, for the, for the communication of the Word of God and the history of God's people, Israel. So it was seen as the most far by, by and large, the most supreme okay, way of communicating, and it was granted all of the credibility that you can muster, that you can possibly give, was given to that. When we, you and I get to the New Testament, it's the first time now it's being written down and it's com being communicated by writing. Listen to me carefully. To the extent that it was going to be communicated. And Luke is in that transition period, okay, remember, he's still working on the law, he's still working under, uh, under Judaism itself, 
okay, when he addresses, uh, and, and, and he addresses, <coughs> excuse me, and interviews a lot of the white witnesses who come from that tradition. Luke himself is a Gentile. So the eyewitnesses accounts, okay, <coughs> excuse me, are highly, highly important because they are, as far as Judaism is concerned, it was the most accurate way of communicating things. So Luke embarks and takes advantage of this by interviewing various people, is what he does. So I want you to see that with me, and he begins to interview these individuals. So when he says that he took his account by hearsay, he's talking about he did interviews with eyewitnesses. <clears throat> uh, the historian Eusebius, Eusebius, uh, when he wrote his uh, Historiacra Ecclesia uh, also affirms that Luke's authorship of both Luke and the book of Acts. Um, there's internal evidence for Luke's authorship as well within the text. Um, and we do see this. I mean, in the book, like so many biblical works, is in fact anonymous. Luke didn't run around putting his name out there on everything. And in addition to that, if Luke and Acts, okay, is a two-volume set, I, I, I think it is. Um, uh, you may agree and you may disagree with me. I think that I stand on the right side of history on this one in that the majority do believe that Luke and Acts uh, both is a two-volume set, uh, which seems true from the, from the familiar uh, uh, introduction that then that we, that we, the sections that we see this, and when we see the word we, this pronoun here, we see we in various sections. We see it in the book of Acts in chapter 16, verses 10 to 17. We see it in Acts chapter 20, verses 5 to 16. We see it in Acts chapter 21, verses 1 through 18. Again, in Acts chapter 27, verses 1, all the way to Acts chapter 28, verse 16. And what, did, what that, 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 that word, we, what does it imply? It implies eyewitness accounts of Paul's missionary activities. And this is what Paul, and this is, I'm sorry, this is where Luke focused in so much of gathering his material is by interviewing all of these eyewitnesses to the life and the story of Jesus Christ. The introduction of Luke, which is what we read earlier in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, states that Luke researched eyewitness accounts in order to write a historical approach to Jesus' life, which shows he was a second-generation believer. So when I told you at the very beginning of class that when I was in South Africa, we had 613 pastors sitting there, and I was teaching, and I, and I told them, I said, I'm not, this is not a trick question. I'm trying, trying to be cute. I'm not trying to deceive you. I just want to know how many of you believe that Luke was one of the original 12 disciples, the apostles, and 209 pastors raised their hands. Okay? Now, if we in the pastor get this wrong, can you imagine everybody else? Welcome back. This is Lecture 8, Part 2. Now let's talk about Luke himself, the author Luke himself, or Luke the man, if you will. You remember that I mentioned to you in the last class about the anti-Marcion prologue, that particular document, somewhere around 175 A.D. It says in there that Luke was, first of all, number one, a native of Antioch of Syria. That's, he, that's where he was from originally. Remember, he is a Gentile. <coughs> He's a native of Antioch of Syria. Um, it says in that particular document that he was, in fact, a physician. He was a doctor. It says he was single. He was not married. And it says that he did all of his writing from Achaia, uh, and from Achaia, and that's in Greece, in Greece. Uh, that's where he did all of his writing from. It was from Achaia and uh, <clears throat> in the southern part of the country. And... Um, generally agree that Luke died, um, and he died around the age of 84 in Boeotia, 
in Boeotia. Boeotia is in the central part of Greece. He wrote in the south. He wrote his epistles. He wrote his epistle, the, the, the Gospel of Luke, and, and he wrote the book of Acts um, in, in the south. But he died eventually in the north in Boeotia, Greece. Okay, And Boeotia was spelled B-O-E-O-T-I-A. <coughs> B O E O T I A, B O S H A, is the, that's how you pronounce it, in central Greece. That's where eventually he dies. And there's a history there, in fact, about it if you were to go to that area of Greece today. Um, and that's pretty much where everybody seemed, at least the majority of your scholars agree that this is where he died. Um, according to Eusebius of Caesarea, in his writings, uh, from 275 to 339 A.D. Uh, and his historiotical ecclesiastics and his and his documents, and he also states that Luke was from Antioch. Uh, it also specifically says that he was a missionary companion to Paul. In addition to that, and it's specifically that document says that he wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Then Jerome, the, four, uh, the church father Jerome, um, in 346 to 420, and his document, the Migna, uh, uh, volume 27, 26, uh, in the Migna, um, he wrote there specifically that uh, Luke also wrote from Achaia in southern part of Greece, and that he died in Boeotia as well. Uh, so we have a number of individuals corroborating the information that this is what happened to Luke. Um, we also know he was a highly, highly educated man. Luke was. Uh, he had good uh, Greek grammar, which was hard and few and very difficult to find among those who had that kind of an ability. But Luke did have an excellent handle on the Greek grammar. He had an extensively very large vocabulary that he utilized. And Luke is out, if you look out of all of the writers, uh, he's the one who, used, who actually employed research methods for gaining all of his information. And it is pretty much that agreed that he was probably a physician. Uh, and, we, and, we, and we say that because in the book of Colossians, uh, if you go to Colossians chapter 4, in Colossians chapter 4, uh, we're led to believe in verse 14, it says this, <clears throat> and this is Paul. <clears throat> Paul is using this term. Luke does not use this term of himself, but Paul does. And we see here, uh, it says in Luke 4, 14, uh, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. Right? Um, we know that Luke was his closest companion. It is believed that Luke was his uh, physician, okay, was his doctor, um, and he traveled frequently and extensively on all, uh, extensively on all of his missionary journeys. Um, and so this is Luke, okay. Uh, in fact, Luke found himself in Rome after a while when, when, when Paul was there as well. Also, Mark... Um, Mark, uh, the, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark's negative comments about physicians, uh, you remember that? Uh, he said, uh, let me give you over there, Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we see uh, where he says this to us here in 5, 526. And uh, in verse 20, coming, starting in verse 25, and a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and endured much at the hands of many physicians and spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. Uh, Mark has some, uh, a disparaging reference to physicians, to doctors. Um, we know that. Um, uh, but it is. But we know that this section here is completely omitted in the book of Luke. We don't, we don't find that even mentioned here in the book of Luke. Uh, um, Luke used a lot of terminology, a lot of, bi a lot of words uh, that was related to medicine in particular, to cures and to diseases, mm -hmm. at least 300 times in his writings. If you were to look up uh, and you were to read uh, W.K. Uh, w. Hobart's book, H-O-B-A-R-T, W.K. Hobart, H-O-B-A-R-T, his book called The Medical Language of Luke, um, or you were to read A. Harnack, A. Harnack, 
H A R N A C K, Harnack's book, uh, Luke the Physician. If you look at those two books, um, I can remember in seminary that we had, we would, it was it was required reading. We had to go through those books and uh, to get an, an essence and, uh, uh, of 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 the, of the of the life of a physician during the gospel period and Luke in particular and so forth. Okay, and and in there you, it is interesting that Luke uses about three and th between these two authors, these two authors they indicate that he uses. The, these kind of terms, medical terms, terms for diseases, terms for cures, terms for medicine, uh, at least 300 times in his writings, and that's quite extensive. In addition, we know that Luke was a Gentile. Clearly, he was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. Uh, first thing, Paul seems to make a distinction in his list of helpers. Uh, if you go back to Luke, I mean to Colossians chapter 4 again, if you go back to Colossians, I just want to show you this again. In Luke chapter, uh, Luke uh, Colossians chapter four. Look at this with me, and, and go down to verse uh, ten and eleven. Now notice, notice the construction of the two lists that he has here, because he has a list of helpers in Colossians. Okay, um, and he says this. He says, um, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings, and also Barnabas' cousins, Mark, about whom you receive instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And also Jesus, who is called Justice, they're only a fellow workers from the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be encouragement to me. So we notice this. So what he does, he, he um, notice that it, it, he, in effect, if you will, he creates a list of two categories here. Uh, and what he does is that in this list, he says, he says, those who are from the circumcision, which is the Jewish ones, and other helpers, okay? And that would be Demas, uh, uh, Epaphras, uh, Luke, and so forth, okay? Who were not there, the Gentiles. In the book of Acts itself, in the, in the book of Acts in chapter 1, right at the very beginning of the book of Acts, uh, if you just go there briefly in the book of Acts, and you know I'm never in a hurry, so uh, you might as well just turn there, just real briefly there, and go to Acts chapter 1. And look at this with me in verse 9. It says the following. It says, And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on a cloud, receive him out of their sight. <clears throat> okay? So notice here what Luke is saying. Luke says that he says in their own language, he's making a reference to this. So notice, remember I told you that he was the only one who used research method, uh, methodology? That was the book of Luke. So he says, and after he said, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while he was looking on, and a cloud received them out of, out of sight. And so we see here in Acts chapter 1, right, <clears throat> that it's in, their, it's in their languages. He's referring to the Aramaic, which implies it was not his language. Um... He makes that reference here very, very, very clearly here. Uh, and so we see that in here. Um, in addition to that, um, in his gospel, Luke himself omits all the controversies with the Pharisees concerning the Jewish oral law. He doesn't even mention it at all, which gets a lot of play in Matthew and, uh, and Mark, but Luke doesn't even mention it. It doesn't even come across his pages at all. So of all of the people, of the writers of the, of, the, of the New Testament, okay, of all the people to be the writer of the longest gospel, Luke is the longest gospel, and with the book of Acts, the writer of the most New Testament, it is surprising that little known non-eyewitnesses, non-apostolic witnesses, this is crucial, non-apostolic witnesses, Gentiles, okay, would be named. And yet this is a unanimous tradition of the early church and there is no dissenters among them. Uh, if you were to take the Old Testament <clears throat> from Genesis to Malachi, you would have pretty much the prophets and the historical books and the writings and the wisdom literature. Okay? Pretty much identifies who is who in that. Uh, the rest of the New Testament books as well. But when you get to <clears throat> Luke, Luke is the only one who relies heavily on eyewitnesses accounts of non-apostolic nature. In other words, he doesn't interview directly the apostles. He interviews all of the other individuals who are in and around and involved intricately and intimately in the life of Jesus. Now the writing of the book of Luke. 
The truth is that one never really knows the exact relationship between Luke's research, which is probably while Paul was in prison uh, um, at Caesarea, because we know that story embarks in Acts chapter 23, 24, 25, and 26, um, and specifically inside of Luke chapter 24, 27, uh, his final draft and the circulation of the document. Uh, because if you go to the end of the book of Luke itself, okay, um, in chapter 24, you notice what he says here in verse uh, 27. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all of the scriptures. Hmm? So we know that as we read this, uh, that he's writing during the time that Paul is in prison. Otherwise, Luke is, in fact, his traveling companion with him. In addition, uh, we think that it was written somewhere before 95 A.D., if uh, first Clement, uh, uh, first Clement is correct, and he quote, he has different quotes and allusions to that fact. Um, in fact, Acts thirteen twenty two uh, also comes to mind in the book of Acts. <clears throat> we see in Acts uh, chapter thirteen uh, where it tells us here um, in verse twenty two is it? He says. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, concerning whom he also testified, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who would do all my will. Okay? Uh, if you look at all this, uh, he quotes out of this particular section here. Um, and this is somewhere, this, this quote and this happening, it definitely is before the A.D. 95. We see confirms Clements in Acts chapter 20, verse 36 as well. Um, it, we know that uh, before the destruction of Jerusalem, A.D. 70, by the, um, by the Roman general Titus, um, uh, and the reason why is because there's no mention of the deaths of James the Apostle in the book of Luke. Uh, so we begin to, you see what we're doing is we're just, we went from 95 down to 70. We're beginning to narrow down more or less when this particular uh, gospel was written. Uh, Surely, if James the Apostle had already been martyred and had been killed, Luke would have mentioned that as part of the writings of the eyewitnesses' accounts. Uh, but there's no mention of that there. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul's death, uh, somewhere around 64 to 67 A.D. Uh, in addition to that, there's no mention of that. Uh, we also have Stephen's great sermon in Acts chapter 7 does not include the destruction of the temple, which would prove God's judgment. If that's not mentioned, uh, and that's around A.D. 70. Um, Paul's visit to Jerusalem in Acts 21. And Luke, if he wrote after A.D. 70, would probably have mentioned the destruction of the temple, but there's absolutely no mention of it. Um, so if Luke used the gospel, and it is believed he did use the gospel of Mark as part of it anyway, as an outline, if in fact if he used Mark, the gospel of Mark as an outline, and or, or Luke wrote close to the time of his research in Palestine, then somewhere in the neighborhood about the late 50s, around the late 50s to early 60s, with Acts written soon after while Paul was still in prison in Rome, somewhere in between 62 and 63. Uh, so mm, that's kind of somewhere between 55 and, and uh, 55 and 60, 61 A.D., somewhere in that time period. Uh, <clears throat> if you just begin to whittle down these other acts, these other events, is when Luke was actually written. And then shortly thereafter, uh, the book of Acts um, as well, and which is why we call it a two-volume set. So who were the recipients? Who were the recipients of um, the, uh, uh, the book of Luke? Well, it mentions Theophilus. Let's go back to Luke chapter 1, please. Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> and here's where we'll park ourselves for a little bit here. Uh, <clears throat> this is some background information uh, to the book of Luke itself. Don't worry, we'll have plenty of time to get into a lot of detailed information about the book of Luke itself. 
So look at this with me. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and Acts 1, 1, specifically mentions Theophilus. And there are various theories about who Theophilus was, right? <clears throat> uh, the first one is that he was a Roman government official because Luke calls him the most excellent <clears throat> in Luke chapter 1, verse 3. And he used his, his same title for Felix, if you remember that, in Acts uh, 23, 26, and Acts 24, 3. And Festus, he also uses that term in Acts 26, 25. So the assumption is that the most excellent, he had to have been some kind of a Roman government official of some type. Um, another, another theory is that he was a wealthy patron, somebody who was a believer, a follower, very wealthy. Um, Theophilus was also a common name among the Jews and the Greeks of that period as well. So it kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to pinpoint who is Theophilus. Um, and it's believed that he helped to pay the expenses for the writing, the copy, and the distribution of the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Um, that's one of the major theories that's about out and about as to who the recipient of the book of Luke was. Uh, also, <clears throat> the word Theophilus, uh, if you recall, uh, Theo is God, okay, a theology, the study of God, Theos, Theos is God, and his, this man's name is Theophilus, okay, and so <clears throat> we would see here that his, main ne his name means God loved or lover of God, um, therefore it is possibly um, as some believe, it's a cryptic, a cryptic reference to Christians. In other words, the Aphelas was written to a very broad audience. So these are different theories of Theophilus. Mm -hmm. Luke, we know, is targeted to Gentiles. We know that. <clears throat> given the language that he uses, given the terminology that he uses, given the fact that he uses over 300 terms in reference to medicine, disease, and cures, he has an extremely extensive Gentile vocabulary. So Luke is targeted to Gentiles, number one, and he explains the Jewish customs. Um, he, there was no need to explain Jewish customs to Jews. They, they understood their own customs, right? It's the rest of us Gentiles need to understand what they were doing. And so Luke does, in the presentation of his gospel, of his writing, he explains the Jewish customs. So it definitely it leads us to believe that it was written to Gentiles. Secondly, God, the gospel is for all of the people because we see in Luke chapter 2, where it says in verse 10, it says, but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all of the people. In addition to that, uh, there are various quotes of prophecies which refer to all of the flesh. Uh, we see this in Luke. Um, you, you, if you look over there in Luke chapter 3, in verses 5 and 6, it says, in Luke 3, 5 and 6, uh, he says, and every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be, be brought low. The crooked will become straight. And, the, and he says, and the rough road smooth and all the flesh will see the salvation of God. That's a quote out of the book of Isaiah. And that would be Isaiah chapter 40. At the, somewhere right at the beginning, I, I think it's verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, I think it's verse 4. Definitely it's right at the beginning of Isaiah, of, of that book. So he quotes Isaiah. Uh, let you know how, how well read uh, Luke was. Um, also, the genealogy that Luke uses, the genealogy uh, goes back to Adam. In other words, it's a reference to all human beings. So Luke, uh, if, you would have, if you were writing a genealogy from a Jewish perspective, you would not go back to Adam. You would go back to Moses, Abraham. Right? Because that's pretty much where, as far as Judaism is concerned, that's who their father was. Okay. <clears throat> uh, if you look at all the genealogies that they ever wrote extensively, it, it, it pretty much stops uh, at, at Abraham. Okay, that's pretty much where the majority of them stop. All right, 
uh, that's not what the Bible says, but I'm talking to you about Judaism. Don't, don't confuse what I just said now. There is a biblical uh, a, a ge a genealogical tables that you see various them in the Old Testament, and it takes us all the way back to Adam. However, in Judaism, they, they pretty much went back only to, to Abraham, and that was about it. That was about it. However, Luke does not. He goes all the way back to Adam, and then in Luke 2.10, it says, it was for all of the people. So he clearly has a Gentile audience in mind here. And then, so we also see that there are many examples of God's um, love for the Gentiles. Uh, Luke extends the boundaries of those welcome at the Messianic banquet. You remember that? Uh, that was kind of unique to the book of uh, Luke. In Luke, uh, let's see, I think it's Luke 13. In Luke chapter 13, <clears throat> before, before it talks about Christ's mourning, um, yes, Look what he says in, ver in Luke 13, 29. And they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. That's a clear reference, okay, to all the people, to all the people, so not to Jews. So Luke, again, I'm just laying out for you the, uh, all of the circumstantial evidence, if you will, as to who is the audience and who are the recipients and who did he have in mind when he wrote out this research project called the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke. Uh, also, the Old Testament example that he uses, he quotes of God's love for Gentiles. Uh, <clears throat> Luke does that. So Luke was an extremely well-educated, well-read individual because in Luke 2, in, in, that, in fact, in Luke 2.32, he says, <clears throat> a light, a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. Look at that. That's amazing, okay? That's an extensive quote out of the book of Isaiah, out of Isaiah. Um, you also see, and in fact, he, he does it again in Luke 4.25, 26, 27, and then also Luke's great commission, the forgiveness preached to all the nations. He lays out the great commission, the forgiveness of, to be preached to all of the nations.